I got into it because I went to have a cup of coffee with a consultant biochemist in our hospital. <laughs> Actually, I took a, a sample up to his laboratory, and he was sitting having a cup of coffee and reading a newspaper. And uh, the day before, he'd suggested that a child in the hospital had got Bath syndrome. And I was a bit perplexed about it, so I went and said to him, Charles, what's this Bath syndrome? And he explained what Bath syndrome was. I said, I've never heard of that disease. How come? Because if it's got low neutrophil counts, why have I never heard of it as a consultant haematologist? Um, and he said, well, he said, I don't know, but this is probably the third case your department's missed. And I said, oh, wow, that's a bit scary. And so I started asking around and finding out about the previous cases that he'd suspected. And it was true that one of the children had had a heart transplant and come back to our hospital after his heart transplant at another hospital and got very bad chicken pox and then got a whole run of serious bacterial infections because he had a low neutrophil count. And so my department had seen him. He'd had a bone marrow test, which just looked a little unhappy, like perhaps he'd had a viral infection. Um, we didn't have any great thoughts as to his diagnosis, and so he'd been essentially discharged by us. And um, then he kept getting these neutropenic infections over the years. And it ended up one of our cardiologists, one of the heart doctors, was reading about uh, I think he was just reading his medical journal and he came across Bath syndrome. And so he told the biochemist and so it all snowballed and we looked back at the other cases and, and then I started worrying that perhaps these children had been diagnosed with what we call viral cardiomyopathy. So that it's quite easy to get a serious virus infection which affects your heart. And viruses often suppress your bone marrow so you get a low blood count as well. And so a child with Barth syndrome could be mistaken as having viral cardiomyopathy. And so I started asking the cardiologist, have you got any boys who've come along with heart failure, with cardiomyopathy, and then turned out to have low neutrophil counts? And I think there were four of them in the hospital at the time, and they all said, no, they hadn't. And then I got a phone call the next day to say, Colin, actually, I've been thinking about that. There is a kid who comes along to the clinic who actually did have really bad heart failure at about nine days of age. And um, yeah, he has got neutropenia, but he's well with it. We've never thought any more of it. And sure enough, he turned out to have Barth syndrome. And um, I think then I went to my fetal pathologists and said, would you have records of children who've died of cardiomyopathy or endocardiofibrillastosis, which is called EFE for short, and it means that the inside lining of the heart becomes densely white. He said, oh yeah, going back about 20 years. And we found a child who died in our hospital in 1959. And um, we actually could go back and find his mother and his grandmother and get DNA off them. And the gene had just been described the previous year and so we sequenced it. And sure enough, that, di that child had died in 1959 in our hospital of Bath syndrome. We diagnosed him 40 years later. I mean, I think what's really exciting is that just earlier this year, a Dutch group um, had taken blood from children in our clinics over in Bristol uh, and used it to develop a test which is based on the lipids in the cell membranes, things we call cardiolipins. And they have developed what seems to be a foolproof test for this disease that can just use one spot of blood. And we actually went back to stored blood spots from babies who'd been born and died or born and were still alive with the diagnoses, and showed that you can make the diagnosis of Barth syndrome on these old stored blood spots, just from about one quarter of one spot. So now, if a family have lost a child, a male, particularly with cardiomyopathy, they can go back and find out what he died from. And that is a revolution in the diagnosis, I think. It allows us to go to probably things like placenti, uh, so the afterbirth from, say, a baby who's died of stillbirth, we can go back and sort out whether they had Barth syndrome. And it's, it's, it is, it's like giving a detective a better microscope. Or it's really exciting. It's, it's particularly tricky, well, it's tricky both in diagnosis and research. Um, to start with, it can kill babies in the womb. So quite a lot of babies will get swollen up in the womb, what they call fetal hydrops, or they'll get frank heart failure in the womb. 
and that may cause them to die then, so they'll be stillborn or miscarried late in pregnancy. Um, it's often very difficult to get to the bottom of why children like that have died because there's probably a myriad of different diseases that can do it. But at least now we've got a very sensitive test that we can apply to those group of children. Or they may come out and get heart failure really early in life or get serious infections or get both. Or get a low blood sugar or a high lactic acid or just not grow properly or have poor feeding, start vomiting be slow to walk. There's just a huge different array of ways that this can present and a lot of those are common to many many different diseases so it is difficult to pick one amongst the other. I think that physicians increasingly are realizing that for children with rare diseases their parents often will be the experts on that disease. There will be nobody in that hospital that will actually understand more in many areas of that disease than the parents themselves and perhaps the patient themselves. And you've just got to, as a physician as well, respect that, that process. If you're a family whose child has got this disease, it's a mysterious disease and your doctors and your nurses mostly don't understand it or have never heard of it. So you have a tremendous feeling of isolation. You're on your own. Well, with an organization like this, it just puts people in touch. They're not on their own any longer and they can start to swap notes to compare problems to ask other families who've been to the same place for solutions. And I think that the Bath Syndrome Foundation has got a critical role in providing those telephone wires between people, really. Um, they've done a huge amount to, act to actually help us doctors who are interested in rare genetic diseases to actually understand the disease. So we used to have what were called question and answer sessions in the early days where I was supposed to be providing the answers to the parents and families and patients questions but I learned far more from the families and the children themselves than I ever gave back to them I think. So it was educational for us of the medical establishment and then it's helped enormously to drive research in what actually is a very very difficult disease to drive research in. Well, the way that research used to be done in rare genetic diseases is that you might have one or two or three children or families affected. And often that simply wasn't enough material to actually make any meaningful scientific inroads. What this organization has done is to collect a, a big repository and a rapidly increasing repository of cells and DNA so that now scientists can come along and provided that their idea looks strong and sound enough they can quite quickly get a lot of cellular material or DNA to work on. That's a huge inroad for a medical scientist. That's the really exciting thing about an organization like this, I think, that it really empowers people, so it gives them knowledge. If physicians care to look at the website, it gives them knowledge. If you look at the publications, it gives you knowledge. But for the families, the other way around. And hopefully, what it empowers is a bringing together of the two so that the families understand the disease much better, their physicians and nurses understand the disease much better, and they can work as a true team, you know, symbiotically helping one another. And this organization, I think, is extremely powerful in making that happen. The knowledge that we have today is mostly because of gifts of DNA or cells that children who are alive with the disease or have already died of the disease have made. And so it's like, passing on a sort of olive branch of peace or something like that. It's, it's a connection, it's a chain that actually allows us all to move forward as humanity. And I really think that there can be no greater gift than cells from someone who's affected to help someone in the future either not be born affected or to have their disease ameliorated uh, or find some new drug or something like that. It's, it's an enormous gift which might transform the whole management of the disease.